Scientologist once told me, said to me, uh, in a demeaning way, you need to be a volcano instead of a clam. What the heck does that mean? I'll explain. My name is Phil Jones. I was in Scientology for 40 years, just under 40 years. I've been out for over 10 and exposing Scientology abuses whenever I can. This is just a little anecdote about something that happened while I was in Scientology. Um, just to give a little background on, on how this works in Scientology with the hierarchy. Um, this guy who said that to me, he was in the Guardian's office at the time, which was considered very high up. I mean, it was like that was an executive uh, branch, and they kind of had their own autonomy. So they, they were, you know, they lorded over pretty much everybody. And uh, um, so I was just Joe Public. And in Scientology, you've got the whole hierarchy from, from Miscavige or Hubbard originally and through RTC and the executive branch and uh, Sea Org executives down to re normal, regular Sea Org people to um, reg uh, local org staff to, to public. And in the public, you've got hierarchy in where you have once maybe somebody who's OT8. And there, there's definitely a, a hierarchy and a clickishness to it all. Um, if you were kind of lower on the hierarchy, even as a public, um, like even in, in Scientology, if you were, you, if you had money, you were higher up on the hierarchy. And if you were OT8 with money, you're, and if you had a lot of money, you're way up there. And I, you know, I remember once when, um, you know, Willie had started a, a business at one point and somebody who had money went to her and said, oh, now you can be in with the in group now. And it's like, yeah, okay. We didn't play that game really. It was, um. It wasn't for us, but but definitely it, it gets played on some people, and some some Scientologists really uh, wear it. I mean, they wear that Scientology arrogance. Not everybody, but there there's definitely a, a, an aspect of that that you see in uh, in Scientologists. So this guy saying this to me, this was like an ultimate diss, and he was it was basically he was gonna he's the volcano throwing shade on the clan. <laughs> Anyway, so what does this mean? So um, there's a book by L. Ron Hubbard called History of Man, and there's a lot of really bizarre stuff in that. It's just uh, some crazy, crazy stuff. But he's got two entries in there, one on the volcano and one on clams. And the, the volcano, uh, there's just one short paragraph. I'll read this. Just uh, I'll try to explain it as I go. It's a little bit sort of Hubbard-ish. He says, now and then the auditor... If, if you're not familiar with auditing, it's Scientology counseling where you have the auditor with the e-meter, the pers other person on the uh, holding these cans and uh, looking in his past past lives millions of years ago. So here you got this auditor, uh, counselor in Scientology with an e-meter, somebody holding the cans, going back millions of years and encounters some incident some time that he was maybe killed by a volcano so now and then the auditor will find a volcanic upheaval incident in restimulation with its pulse of choking sulfurous smoke so in restimulation means that say a million years ago a volcano killed him or whatever he was at the time whatever and then in present day something like somebody was lighting a fire in a campground and all of a sudden he gets this burning on his skin or something. And that's supposedly what happens, but it's just Hubbard hogwash kind of stuff. But that's the concept that, that he's trying to get across here. So now and then the auditor will find a volcanic upheaval incident in restimulation with its pauls of choking sulfur smoke. It has been suggested that smoking tobacco is a sort of dramatization of volcanoes, which at least were spectacular. So Hubbard thinks that the volcano was spectacular, and therefore, if you're smoking, you're spectacular somehow, I guess. Um, and you're on, you're at the cause of the problems around you rather than the effect of it. So then you got the clam, and he's got a, a couple of entries on the clam. So just to give a little background of, before I read it, because it's a little bit uh, Hubbard-ish. Um, so his theory, or his 
I mean, he doesn't put it forth as, this, as a theory. He puts it forth as this is how it was, but there's no scientific basis for it anything that he says or writes in this book of history of man so he basically theorizes that the clam was evolving and coming out of the ocean and developing lungs and it sort of sat on the edge of the ocean on the beach for um half a million years while it was evolving so he says in in uh, history of man he says after leaving the sea the clam he calls it the genetic entity spent a half a million years on the beach. Still obtaining its food from the waves, the clam the weeper would open up to get food from the water and get a wave in the shell. It would vigorously pump out the water, trying to get some air, because it was evolving apparently lungs at the time. And then before it could gulp atmosphere, it was hit by another wave. And, um, and here was anxiety, Hubbard says, here was anxiety. So, you know, I, I guess he's explaining this is one reason that humans have anxiety. Okay. Uh, the sand got into it, and it had to pump water swiftly in order to continue to live. So wave hits, clam opens up to get its food from the wave, starts pushing out the water, and maybe some sand or whatever, and then another wave hits before it can finish that, and whatever. Somehow it survived half a million years i guess i don't, I don't know it's it's hubbard right <laughs> so and then he goes on to say and at this point he's he's calling the the clam the clam the weeper this is his thing about clams is that they are considered the weeper because so he says the weeper is so called because it had to pump salt water it was deduced by hubbard of course that crying in a human being is very unnatural why is it that a human has to pump out some salt water in order to feel better? Which is to say, why does crying out a grief charge produce such a change in a case? So what that means, um, like he calls a grief charge, like Hubbard considers that everything in the reactive mind or in anything in our past that affects us has an actual electrical charge on it. And that's why the meter works or some, some I don't know, it's, it's, it's kind of dumb, but but uh, so when he says that uh, when you're crying out a grief charge, why does it produce a change in the case? Uh, and the, he says the incident must be one of pumping out salt water. So he's basically saying that um, when you're crying, you're, 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 you're dramatizing the millions of years ago when the clams evolved out of the ocean so here's the thing we did not evolve from clams we did not evolve from clams there is no scientific proof of any kind ever ever that we evolved from clams so the whole idea of tears being a result of clams being in in salt water and pushing out salt water because of the sand and the waves hitting it's just like hubbard crazy so but so let's go back to the insult here. So this guy is smoking and thinking all, he's all, you know, big shot. And I'm sitting next to him and I politely said, do you mind not smoking next to me? So his insult was basically saying that I'm a whiner or weeper and that I, I should be a volcano, take up smoking and blow smoke in other people's faces so that I can, I can whatever you know, or stimulate other people or something. I don't know. It was just a mean, nasty kind of thing for somebody to say. And, um, and he wasn't kind of a nasty kind of guy. Guardian's office people were often like that. Not, not all of them. I knew a few that were back in those days that were reasonably nice people, but, uh, but there was definitely, he had that Scientology arrogance. So, so the insult goes, don't be a vulc or don't be a clam, be a volcano, or be a volcano instead of a clam. And that's just saying, hey, stop whining, start smoking, or, or be, the, be, the, be the big shot or whatever, I don't know, and, and lord, over, lord over the beach and throw smoke on, on clams or something anyway. So that's, that's my little anecdote of where I got my big insult uh, from, I mean, it's just epic. It's only, only an insult like that happens in Scientology. There's just nowhere else that particular insult is going to happen. 
So anyway, right now, I'm going to show you where we are. We're just, uh, this, we're in Niagara Falls, in case somebody doesn't know. I'm going to walk us over there to, um, um, all right. So let me flip this around. All right. So we are downriver from Niagara Falls. And this is just over the top of the Niagara Gorge. We're, I don't know how far, maybe half a mile, a mile below the falls here. And um, just up the river a little ways, you should be able to see it from here, is the Whirlpool. There it is. I don't know if you can see it on the thing here, but this is uh, Niagara Gorge, Niagara River, below the falls. On the left there is United States, on the right is Canada, and way down there is the Whirlpool, and there's a, a zip line over it. No thank you, I'm not going to do that, ever. <laughs> so, um, that, uh, oh, here we go, sorry, I... Garment, uh, uh, gimbal hijinks here, tilting the wrong way, and uh, I still call my gimbal Jimmy, Jimmy Gimbal. <laughs> anyway, that's my story for today, and I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we're in a nice little park here just uh, along the river, and um, it's been a nice, a beautiful day today. A little cloudy, but uh, very, very nice. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining and watching and uh, um, just being there. I appreciate it. I appreciate every single person who comes along and watches, participates, uh, make comments, um, put a like if you like, if you did like, if you didn't, no problem. <laughs> anyway, bye for now. Love you all.